the heart of the English countryside have long hidden some of the earliest films ever made in and of China. Fascinating to see them, the facial expression of these people. It brings everything alive. It's fantastic. It provides you a window to gaze into the life of the past. Much of Chinese life and history is here, from the last days of the Qing Dynasty to the start of the Communist Revolution. This is actually one of the most crucial periods in the formation of modern Chinese history. It is an era of tragedies and triumph. It really shaped what was to come. Documenting all of this, I think it's hugely important. It has great historical significance. Now, for the first time, we can show a lost China, preserved forever and for all on film. This is quite possibly the first ever color film shot in China. It shows Beijing's Tiananmen Gate in the 1930s. Beijing was no longer the nation's capital at this time. The nationalist or Kuomintang government had moved their capital to Nanjing. Beijing was renamed Beiping, which means Northern Peace. The gate looks decidedly bleaker than it does today. The northern peace didn't last. Having defeated the nationalists in 1949, Mao stood here to proclaim the People's Republic of China and reclaim Beijing as its capital. Tor Hugo Wistrand was not just a Swedish diplomat. He was an avid filmmaker, capturing the energies of the times. This is the first uh, piece of archive film that I've seen in this collection that's actually in color. And it's wonderful. You know, it's just so lively. You can actually imagine all the colors and the sounds and the smells. And now actually seeing it in color, of course, it's even you know, much, uh, much more alive. You notice that, um, whereas in the old days, men would have worn these long robes stretching down to the ground, they're now in Western suits, looking very trim, with their little hats and the tie, and uh, obviously looking quite the suave Western-type businessman. No matter how modern one dressed, or how the times were changing, with death, you have to go back to your roots. In traditional mourning costume, and following time-honored rites. Street shows were another favorite with the filmmakers, even more so when children were involved. School was not an option when you had a family to feed, no matter how young or old you may be. But, if you had any money, what better way to spend it than at one of Shanghai's new Western-style funfairs? This is a really generous and beautiful portrait of a funfair in Shanghai in the late 20s. It was made by Topical Budget, who were Britain's premier newsreel production company at the time. This is a film full of dynamism. Yeah, the funfair is all about motion, speed and movement. And the camera does, does its bit to kind of give the audience that thrill. It's always panning or moving. Even at one point, the film gets on top of the Caterpillar ride and goes along with the audience. The filmmaking is quite playful, sitting underneath the big wheel and watching people towering above you and coming down. Projected at 40 square feet, it would look quite amazing. That picture uh, tells me 
uh, the material life uh, during the 20s, 30s uh, was very good. And you have a great deal of Western influence in Shanghai as a treaty port. Basically, male population, middle class, they certainly have these Western you know, suits, Western influence. And the female population, they have silk. Yeah, you see this you new know, Chinese chipo, which is the Chinese uh, dressing gown uh, made of silk. The middle class certainly uh, was very comfortable in Shanghai. And also I saw a few European faces. It means racially, it is a harmony. Yeah, it's not actually a, a apartheid of any kind. This film's title board says so much more about the filmmakers than about the people of Shanghai. Throughout China, ports and cities hummed with activity. Shanghai, on the coast, became a symbol of the new age of industry and commerce. Doctors the 1930s were Shanghai's golden years. And the monumental Western-style buildings on the Bund shouted out the city's status as Asia's greatest trading port. This is the, the great sweep of the majestic Bund, really uh, just a Hindi word from British India, meaning uh, raised waterfront. And by this point in the 1930s, you're seeing all of the classic buildings that you would recognize today if you went there, the Customs House, uh, the Bank of China, the Cafe Hotel, now the Peace Hotel, all of those classic Art Deco modernist buildings. The Bund survived two wars. It's been more or less preserved even through the communist years. Ironically, it was this grand capital statement in stone that made China's leaders want to show a new face to the world. Deng Xiaoping was growing increasingly impatient with economic reform. And he visited Shanghai and he pointed at the water bund. He said, if this was a financial district built by Western colonists, I mean, why is it that we can't top them? We should be able to do better. And that's why he was pointing at Pudong. And this is where the Pudong Financial District came up. This is Shanghai's main shopping street in 1900. This is the, now the Nanjing Road, White Way Laidlaw and Company, one of the earliest foreign department stores then. And you can see a Chinese Shanghai municipal policeman directing the traffic along with his Sikh colleague. Uh, heavy traffic, trams running south to north across the settlement. Uh, Hall and Holtz, another uh, big department store, the bus networks that ran. The storefronts and shops have had a makeover. They've been redeveloped since it was first filmed decades ago. Interestingly, the traffic police still work in more or less the same way at the same junction today. This was, by the 1930s, really the high point of Shanghai, one of the most modern cities in the world, full of cars, full of very modern architecture. You can see the peak of the Cafe Hotel there that you would still see today. If you walk down there, all of these buildings still remain. Um, an incredibly modern city, yet still with rickshaws, still with pockets of great poverty. Um, but compared to the rest of China, uh, I mean, just unbelievably modern. One landmark then as now is the Wai Baidu Bridge. The British called it the Garden Bridge. It remains as iconic today as it was then. One thing about certainly the case of Shanghai was this infrastructure, and the Wai Baidu Bridge was probably one of these towering infrastructure, which was, you know, it's, it's nothing like a big deal today, but at that time it was it's still a huge deal. It was supposed to be a toll bridge, and the Chinese resisted, and eventually it was built for free, and, and it was built with the concrete iron structure um, 
that was very, very uh, shocking at the time to the, to the, in terms of imagery to the, to the Chinese. I think that remained very, very important. And also that was the bridge that was dividing the Shanghai between North and South. So that's a very, very critical area as well. Now, of course, it's very well preserved. It's uh, probably a lot of the young couples taking photos there were intrigued by the shape, but, but not knowing much about the history of it, not knowing about the full implication of what happened there. By the 1930s, Chinese-owned businesses had developed enough to compete in world trade. It was a trendsetter. So you have many industrialists making great fortunes. I mean, I'm talking about really vast fortunes there, opening factories and so on and so forth. And they are clearly thinking in a very Western way because this is the way to develop. Textiles were a major product. High-end fashion was their showcase. But through the so-called Mao years, the Chinese had to dress down. But then, just 40 years later, Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms made the Chinese once again more active participants in what fashion is all about. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. By the 1930s, Shanghai had become one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. You just needed to take a walk in the park, and you'd see that. At the time this film was made, 80% of the foreigners in Shanghai's international settlement were Japanese. The amateur who filmed this was a British officer in the Shanghai Municipal Police Force. Richard Martin, who, who filmed this, was married to a Japanese, and so one of the things that he did film is, is scenes of a Japanese beer festival, or at least a Japanese cultural festival. Probably in Honku Park, we see there things that would be very recognizable to us. You know, everybody moving from beer tent to beer tent, Asahi, Kirin. I mean, these are still, of course, you know, the most famous uh, beer brands in Japan. Um, and really, the, the communities were quite interactive. But by uh, 1937, all of this had become very difficult. Uh, Japan was being run by a militarist clique. It had decided to move in on China. Uh, uh, and, and so relations between Chinese and really all other foreigners and the Japanese became very strained indeed. In just a few years' time, many of Richard Martin's friends would be taking opposite sides in the bloodbath now called the Battle of Shanghai. In 1931, the Japanese occupied China's northeast, also known as Manchuria, which they renamed Manchukuo. The next few years were to be dominated by the increasing threat of their troops along China's northern border. A trip from Hong Kong up the Pearl River was a rite of passage for many British visitors to China. For them, Guangzhou was just like Shanghai, a colonial treaty port with a bond. Edwin Phillips was an amateur expat photographer. Here he records his wife and friends negotiating the alleys and byways of what he called the old city. Guangzhou's new city streets were very different from Shanghai streets of the time. In this one street in the Liwan district, you can locate from where this shot was taken.
the Tao Tao Ju tea shop still serves dim sum today. It was nationalized in the communist era and remains state-owned today. But here, as in Shanghai, there are also signs of social change. Certainly compared with this couple, filmed in the last years of the Qing Dynasty. We've got two very contrasting images. Uh, one of this couple uh, who are eating, and that's obviously a Qing Dynasty couple uh, eating their rice. And you can see that the woman there, although she's been told that she's got to eat in front of the camera, she keeps on averting her eyes all the time. But when we go to 1930s, you have the couple who's, who's walking towards the camera, and there she's sort of looking full on, you know, absolutely um, boldly and confidently. And clearly you can see that women's minds, their, their mindsets are, are changing. By the 1930s, urban youth had enjoyed several decades of economic and cultural change. The coastal cities of China were becoming as modern as anywhere in Europe or even North America. Any trip to Guangzhou was a waste of time, unless you visited Zhongshan, where the founder of the Republic of China, Sun Yat-sen, was born. Now, Sun Yat-sen himself served for scant six weeks as president of China in early 1912, before being dislodged by a militarist leader. But the memory of Sun Yat-sen as a figure who symbolized that important goal, Chinese political unity and modernization, is still the reason that if you ask any Chinese politician, both on the mainland and, of course, on the island of Taiwan, which has a separate government at the, uh, at the moment, they will both probably say that they regard Sun Yat-sen as really being a key figure. Sun's successor also rose to power in Guangzhou, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. He was a military general for the Nationalist Party, and he established the military academy one of the first modern military academy in China. He was the principal um, of the military academy. Some of the officers in this famous Wangpu Academy would soon become Zhang's deadly enemies. You have to remember many of the very left-wing party in the Nationalist Party, they, many of them were act active in the military academy as well, and, some, and many of them joined communists later after in the your nationalist and communist are broken up. Civil war erupted, pushing the communists to retreat into the remote region of Shanxi in northwestern China. It was here that the young Mao Zedong realized that it was the peasants who could be China's revolutionary force rather than the urban proletariat of the Russian Revolution. Eighty percent of Chinese at the time were farmers and peasants. Yet we find far fewer films of them than those of the people in the big cities of the East. Lady Dorothy Ahosi made the exception. This is her film of farmers near Nanjing. Lady Hosey is quite an amazing woman. She was born in China to one of the most famous missionaries, a man called W.E. Suthill, British Protestant missionary in China. Um, and so she was born and raised in China. And then she married a man much older than herself, a man called Hosey, obviously, who was a British uh, diplomat in China. And she was widowed. Um, and after she was widowed, she went back to China and really um, pushed a lot of work among Chinese Christians, particularly Chinese Christian women, to create education opportunities for Chinese girls um, and to look at the rights of Chinese women as well, such as they were understood in the 1930s. So, and you can see when she went back, she decided to film her tour of China. And there's lots of footage of her at amazing new buildings that have been built, which are mostly schools and colleges, and mostly for 
all for Chinese, and mostly for Chinese women particularly. She's, she's really a, a very important character who, even though by the time she went back in the 1930s and filmed this, was quite elderly, she, um, she was still uh, embracing uh, modern ideas about China and encouraging people to be modern. Somewhat, uh, you know, maybe we can go as far as to say she was a proto-feminist, although ostensibly she was, she was effectively a Christian missionary and an advocate for education. and the most Christian, most educated, modern Chinese woman of them all was Song Meiling, the woman who ultimately became Madame Chiang Kai-shek. There were three Song sisters, each of which, in their different way, promoted the role of Chinese women in society. May I introduce to the audience the president of the national government of the Republic of China. Mei Ling's eldest sister married H. H. Kong, China's richest man. Her second sister married the founder of the Republic of China, Sun Yat-sen. And Mei Ling married Chiang Kai-shek, but only on condition that he convert to Christianity. There's this nice little rhyme that was uh, quite popular in, on, uh, in modern China, which goes, Song Ai Ling, Ai Qian, Song Mei Ling, Ai Quan, Song Qingling, Ai Renmin, which means Song Ai Ling loved money, because she married the richest man. Uh, Song Mei Ling loves power, because she married the Geronimo. And Song Qingling loves the people. It was Mei Ling's Western education that advanced Chiang's policies at home and in the West. Madame Chiang Kai-shek was the daughter of a wealthy, uh, Chinese diaspora family. She was so well healed that they sent her and her sisters to America, to Wellesley College in her case, to study uh, and to speak perfect American English. And she was essentially Chang's avenue to the outside world. She was able to speak to foreign reporters and uh, to foreign politicians in a language that literally they would understand. But the West wasn't China. China needed to find its own way through the troubles that lay ahead. Nineteen thirty seven was a turning point in the history of Shanghai and of China. But on the street, life was as it always had been. The Bund on a Sunday morning. Men and their songbirds. These are among the last images of the city's inhabitants before their lives would be turned upside down. Lady Hosey is busy behind the camera, filming potential benefactors for her schools. Not sure who these Chinese women are, but they're probably um, well-meaning Christian Chinese women looking to raise money for girls' education in China. And I think this must be the autumn of 1936, judging by the um, trees and bushes. Um, but just before it turns cold, so late September, October, that was the really the last uh, summer, autumn of peace in Shanghai, because ne the next summer the Japanese attacked. So. This is very much the, the very last days of, of that old Shanghai. In Christmas that year, police inspector and amateur filmmaker Richard Martin took time out with his children and Japanese wife to prepare for Christmas. A few weeks later, he filmed British troops parading along the Bund a show of force. Curious Shanghainese walk along beside the soldiers. Only one twentieth the size of China and only one sixth the population of China to think of conquering China 
as the first step to world conquest. In 1931, they embarked on phase one, the occupation of Manchuria. The small bonfire that the Japanese lit in Manchuria was to grow and spread with uncontrolled. For six fury. years now, the Japanese had been brutally colonizing the Northeast, which they called Manchu Guo. This propaganda film shows extraordinary footage of the man they've imposed as their puppet leader, Pui, effectively China's last emperor. In August 1937, the Japanese provoked a skirmish with Chinese troops. The clash occurred at the ancient Luguo Bridge, or what the West calls the Marco Polo Bridge. Chiang Kai-shek's government, the national government of China in Nanjing, had been essentially ceding to Japanese requests year after year in the 1930s. This time, they said no. And as a result, within days, it wasn't just a local clash, it was a national clash of China and Japan fighting each other, first in North China around Beijing, and then expanding to the Yangtze Delta around Shanghai. From there on, the conflict escalated into all-out war. Many of the films showcase the modernization of China in the years before the war. This was a period of economic growth, more and more liberal universities and schools, and increasing freedom for women, all of which was so short-lived. So China was on the verge of becoming another Europe or another United States. But then you have the Japanese invasion, um, and that invasion actually stopped the natural course towards uh, democracy and the westernization. The Japanese expected to conquer China in three short months. But the Chinese were more resilient, more militant than expected. And the war would last eight years. One month into the war, the Japanese Navy sailed up the Huangpu River, intent on capturing Shanghai. Their battle cruisers shelled areas just north of the international settlement. So when the Japanese bombed Jabe and Baoshan, they were not actually attacking the international settlement. Japan did not want to do that. It just wanted to fight with, uh, with China, obviously, and take over China. Um, so lots of foreigners, and particularly foreign cameramen, went to take that uh, to footage to show that uh, the devastation that was being wrought over there. These images were captured by the amateur cameraman and police officer Richard Martin. He filmed alongside news reporters from high above the Wai Baidu Bridge. The top floor of the luxury Broadway mansions provided a perfect vantage point to record the first great bombings of a major city in history. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese flooded across the Waibaidu Bridge in search of food and shelter.
they were being pushed on one side by Japanese soldiers forcing them out of the area at bayonet point and being received on the other side by foreign soldiers who had to be reasonably rough in, in pulling them through and moving them on. So there was this massive push, but there weren't that many bridges over the Suzhou Creek. The smaller ones had been closed off, so it meant that everybody had to go over the Garden Bridge. And that's why we have these, this incredible footage of everyone streaming south, down from Hong Kong, across the Garden Bridge, which then becomes a funnel where there were lots of people crushed and some people, you know, forced over the railings into the creek and so on to drown. During the Battle for Shanghai, over 400,000 refugees escaped into the international settlement and the French concession. The strain on all is evident in this fundraising film from the International Red Cross. Images, visual images, are absolutely central to the way in which the first months of the war between China and Japan are understood. The way that filmmakers captured what was happening in Shanghai during the battle, the terror and the turmoil, was absolutely central in terms of educating the Western world about the war. August 14, 1937, is now known as Bloody Saturday. The first two bombs at 4.27 in the afternoon hit outside at the junction of uh, the Bund and Nanjing Road, right where the Palace Hotel and the Cafe Hotel were killing many people that were on the street at the time. A few minutes later, another couple of bombs landed just across the border in the French concession outside what was known the Great World Amusement Centre, which was also a refugee centre at the time, killing many, many more people. I mean, thousands of people. At the time, this was the largest uh, civilian death by aerial bombardment in history. The fighting in the outskirts of the city was just as deadly, as one of Richard Martin's films, Shanghai Personal Film, reveals. He had extraordinary access to a battle which was to involve hundreds of thousands of troops. Shanghai has a, has a very developed um, city also retains a very strong international status. So it means that loads of foreign residents in Shanghai would witness this moment together with the Chinese. And they witnessed a valiant defense by the well-trained nationalist army. Japanese commanders had assumed in their battle plans that they would really conquer what they thought were weak and useless Chinese troops very, very quickly. They did not get an easy fight. They managed to hold out for several months. The nation is at stake. The very survival of the nation is once again at stake. In December 1937, the Japanese finally defeated the Chinese army. After three months of fighting, and 350,000 casualties. Richard Martin recorded the conquering army making its presence felt as it marched down Nanjing Road. They'd expected an easy victory, but lost half of their troops. It showed the rest of the world that Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government was ready to fight. It would not simply abandon its cities without any kind of effort. And secondly, it showed the Japanese that the Chinese would not easily be defeated. Outside the foreign settlement, Shanghai was left a wasteland, a desolate playground for Richard Martin's children, all of whom were to witness another eight years of total war.
These pictures of an eerily empty forbidden city were taken by Thor Hugo Wistrand in 1938. The Swedish diplomat had obtained special permission from the Japanese to film in the newly conquered city of Beiping. When Western was filming, few foreigners were left in the city, and locals were reluctant to go out in the streets. In Beiping's Suzhou Hutong, Western's camera captures one fleeting image of a Japanese soldier. Or is he a Chinese collaborator? Japanese-occupied cities like Beiping, which was what Beijing was known as at the time, do seem to have had some aspects of the police state. So, for instance, many ordinary citizens were forced to have what was called a good conduct or good behavior certificate, a kind of ID pass, which they needed to show to the Japanese authorities at various times. There would also, in some cases, be uh, passes that would need to gain rations or to gain access to certain buildings or services. And all of this gave the impression, which hadn't really existed in the peacetime period, that the Japanese were trying to clamp down and control everyday life in those cities. As a Swede, Wistrom was neutral to either side. He was free to roam and filmed as he wished even at the bridge where the war first started, 20 kilometers outside Beijing. The Western nickname has generally been the Marco Polo Bridge, partly because it might, or might not, have been a bridge that Marco Polo noted in his travels as he made his way into the city of Beijing back in medieval times. In the 80 years since Wistran recorded these shots, the bridge has acquired a greater significance. It's revered as a monument to China's war of national struggle against the Japanese. The battered lines in the old footage have been replaced. Bullet trains now speed over the ancient camel route. In the six months after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, the Japanese conquered all the major cities and much of eastern China. So Chiang and his government had decided early on they would have to retreat to the interior. They set up a temporary capital in the southwestern city of Chongqing, right in the heart of China, on the confluence of two rivers there, the Yangtze and the Jialing. And by doing that, they made essentially a decision that eastern China would have to be abandoned for the moment. This is the battle of China. As the war waged, the world looked on. Oscar-winning director Frank Capra made this US propaganda film with Disney graphics about the Nationalist Army retreating, then recouping, ready to fight another day. The war displaced millions of people. The Sino-Japanese War would make 80 million people into refugees. But there was no escaping the bombers. It was now Chongqing's turn to become the most heavily bombed city so far in history. Extraordinary wooden stilted hanging houses, first filmed in 1930, were obliterated. Today, the entire area has been completely redeveloped. 
the ancient stilted houses survive only on just a few seconds of celluloid. The war would see no more films from China's foreign filmmakers. Lady Halsey went home to Britain. Richard Martin, the filmmaker who captured the bombing and the Battle of Shanghai, stopped filming once Japan declared war on Britain. His wife was Japanese. It was obviously a very good marriage because they had six children uh, in all, and he remained in the Shanghai Municipal Police and obviously a, a keen amateur cameraman as well because we have lots of footage from him. Uh, until uh, 1942, when, of course, as an allied national, after the Japanese occupation of the international settlement following Pearl Harbor, he was eventually interned uh, in, a, in a prisoner of war camp uh, for the duration of the war. The rest of Richard Martin's family escaped imprisonment thanks to his wife's nationality. But he seems to never have filmed again. Something in the struggle against the Japanese created a new way of looking at China and the Chinese. Once again, the people have shown their remarkable ability to survive an overwhelming calamity. They learned the discipline and order of drill. They knew they must strike and strike hard. The commentary still sounds pompous, but at least there's a shift in the way China is seen. Also came forward training to care for the sick and the wounded. And this is quite different from the archive material we've uh, already looked at. It's no more the foreign exotica of the East. Uh, it's no more, you know, peasant folk or quaint customs. We're actually looking at people at work and at school studying. And now the West is finally taking a serious look at China. And China, in its own turn, is taking a serious look at itself. Look at this, a shot of the Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek. We see Mao Zedong uh, at the beginning of his communist revolution. We're looking at the politics behind it all. Western filmmakers began to focus more on Mao and the communists. Secure in the remote countryside, they were building up their forces, gaining support amongst the peasantry. The destruction of traditional society by the war also provided an opportunity for one group, the Chinese Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong. Mao was often said to have chuckled, either to visitors or to himself, that in some ways, ironically, he was grateful to the Japanese for having invaded China. The logic being that if they hadn't done that, then the circumstances which enabled him to lead a communist revolution in the countryside and then the cities might never have happened. The tide was turning in Mao's favor. By now, his communist army had grown to include 1,200,000 men. At the same time, runaway inflation and rampant corruption was turning the people away from the nationalist Kuomintang. The nationalist had lost its support. It was the heavy tax imposed on people and because of the war, partly because of the war. And, you know, after so many years of war and people wanted to peace. And, they, and, and the communists were able to deliver that. In May 1949, the retreating Kuomintang nationalists passed south down the Ban to evacuate to Taiwan. As the communists approached, the Westerners began to pack up and leave, taking all they had with them. It was the end of a century of Shanghai as a cosmopolitan city and China as an open economy. Now it was the communists' turn to march through Shanghai, straight down Nanjing Road.
the same road that so many people and troops had marched up and down in the previous 50 momentous years. It is an era of, of tragedies and, and triumph for Chinese history. It really shaped what was to come. A lot of the language, a lot of the ways we're thinking about Chinese history or where China's heading, in many ways, is shaped by the rhetoric and the ideology of that period. It's a period that has been brought back to life by forgotten moments on reels of lost film. Certainly for Chinese people in China looking at this, I think it would be very eye-opening indeed uh, just to look back and see how the country has just changed so enormously. Now you look at the film dating back to the 1900s and you think, my God, China has really come a long, long way. What's going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Mm -hmm.